Hi everyone, we are live. It's 12.15, slightly odd time at which to start, but forgive me for that. Uh, welcome one and all. Sorry, I am about three minutes late. There's a whole bunch of new slides I wanted to add, new research, a new way of looking at some of the stocks, and also I wanted to make it bang up to date, okay? So welcome one and all. Grab a pen and paper, close the doors, make sure the TV's off and nobody else is using broadband. Uh, let me know you can see and hear me loud and clear. Hi, Themis, it's been a while. Um, let's schedule a call, actually. Uh, tell me which parts of the world you are from as well, please. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorting out my cryptocurrency gains. I wish. I don't tend to get into more volatile ends of the market. That kind of sort of speculating gambling is not so much for me. So those of you who did, well done. You're absolute geniuses. You should all be running your own countries. Uh, but for the rest of us, a bit more slow and steady and stable, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, so apologies, Oliver. Portugal, welcome. <laughs> and Vladislav, thank you very much for your message. Right, let's get on with it. Looks like you can all see and hear me uh, as well. I'm going to share the slides because I've got a hell of a lot of stuff that I want to get on with. And I want to cut straight to the chase with some of the stocks that I happen to like the most at the moment. Now, if you've been on my talk over the last couple of uh, episodes that I've done, and Vladislav, I know you have a recognized quite a few of the, the names, then you will know that part of my job in this is to level the playing field, okay? So when I read things like uh, this headline, it really annoys me. So part of this webinar is about making sure you get access to what UBS's rich clients get. What they get out of Goldman, PIMCO, uh, and all the rest of it sort of huddle together, and they share uh, their wealth-making tips, and make no mistake, they're rich, not out of luck, but more probably out of coordinated action. I'm going to make sure you get it in this webinar because my because as a hedge fund manager, I get this information crossing my desk all the time. Well, my job mainly becomes to sift out the nonsense from the reality, and occasionally you see things like that, and you know, oh, okay, wait a minute, hang on, what the hell? Um, so I'm going to share some of that with you on this. Thank you all from gorgeous... Scotland, Sweden, Portugal. Wow, have we got anybody from Britain? Uh, maybe we'll close the borders. I don't know. The other thing we're going to do in this webinar is we are going to look at 12 months. Now, somebody said to me, why do you hold things for 12 months and then review? And I might re, I might continue holding for another 12 months and another 12 months. But the reason I don't do the buy, hold, and forget is this. It's a slide from Goldman Sachs, and I'll explain to you what it means. What it's saying is, it used to be in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s, funds, which are the big movers in the markets because they've got the trillions, uh, held for, you know, two years. This is the number of years on average they used to hold for. Nowadays, they tend to hold for about a year. So we also want to review after a year. Okay, beautiful Slovakia. Okay, we want to hold for about a year. So I want to get some of the basics on the process out of the way right at the start. That's the reason why we're going to be looking at one year. A lot of you coming in a little bit late, settling in. So I don't want to get to the stocks, which is the next slide, uh, before you've all settled in and got into your seats and got your pens and paper ready. And please, the other thing I need you to get ready is this, a cell phone, so you can take pictures. Because I'm going to go through the slides quickly, I don't want anybody complaining that, oh, I didn't see it, you moved through them too quickly, how are we supposed to do it? Take photos. If you want, just keep recording the whole presentation if you want, all right? But take images of the most important slides if you don't mind. Okay, uh, 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 as well, Ian, I know, I know, and I like your Yorkshire jokes as well, my friend. Um, uh, so that's why I say 12 months, because sometimes midway through the webinar, people go, why do you keep saying 12 months? Why should you, why are you not holding stocks for just a week or a day? Uh, because we're buying and holding in this webinar. This webinar is about investing, not trading. And then they say, well, why aren't you just buying and holding them forever? We heard you should buy stocks you love so much, you're married to them for the rest of your life. No, we review it after 12 months because the world changes quickly and other factors might come into play. Okay, just look at what happened 12 months ago. We didn't know COVID was gonna hit. Well, I certainly didn't, okay? Uh, so 12 months and then we review, and this is from Goldman Sachs Asset Management, which just backs up my argument anyway, even if they didn't say I knew that was the case. So here are some of the ones I'm gonna talk about. They're not the only ones. I'm gonna talk about a whole load more. I've actually got a spreadsheet up, which I'm gonna dazzle you with, which has got about 9,000 equities. Don't worry, I'm not gonna talk about all 9,000. You'll be here till next year if I did that. But this is the issue, which stocks, okay? And I've, I've given some names you recognize, but we're gonna talk about names you might not recognize, right? Zoom, Disney, Apple, Costco. How do we decide, right? And one of the ways I wanted to depict things in a slightly different manner for you on this occasion was, it, it's a slightly different way of depicting information. 
is this. Look, we want to try and get, I want to try and always get a 40% return if I'm looking at not UK stocks, but global stocks. Okay, so if I find something like a MasterCard, and were I to believe, not that I necessarily do, that past performance is an indicator of future performance, were I to believe that, and I don't necessarily do that, okay, then given how it's done in the past, if it did as well as the 90th best times it's ever done, so, you know, the top 10% of its performances, then it would end up somewhere like this by 2024. That's the um, that's the route it would take. Now, don't worry about the statistics and the maths, just rest assured, it's been done. If it did uh, uh, the, the, the worst it's done, the 10% of the time worst it's done, it would take this path. Okay, now again, don't worry about the mathematics and the statistics. We're making a lot of assumptions here. And one of the biggest assumptions, which we do not accept anyway, is that past performance is a guide to the future. It isn't. But just bear with me for a second. Just bear with me for a second. And thank you, Vladislav, and I will take you up on that offer as well. Uh, bear with me for one second. The median, okay, which given that we're making a lot of assumptions, might be a fair place to start, would take us there, which would give us roughly were history to repeat itself, given the statistical performance of this stock in the recent past, would give us a 31% performance projection. Now, we know that past is not a guide to the future because all sorts of things can happen. There could be nuclear wars. There could be uh, viruses. There could be all sorts of things, okay? So if I put all those caveats to one side for a second, let's suspend belief for one second, right? I essentially want to try and get companies which, which at the bare minimum will give me an upward move, okay? And MasterCard, by the way, I happen to hold, not because of this chart, not because of this chart, but because how do I then, when I see something like this, say to myself, okay, well, if past performance is not a guide to future performance, what might be a good indicator? What track record? might be. Has the company got a track record of increasing profit growth, even in downturns like COVID, in the most difficult of times? Not the best of times. In the best of times, everybody's a genius. In a bull market, you don't need me. You don't need webinars. You don't need anything. You're all geniuses. Because in a bull market, we all are. Okay. But what about trying to keep some of that money when the markets go down? Because that's what makes differentiates the rich from the poor. The rich can keep the money when the markets fall. So what can I look at in these companies? which will give me a better indication that they're likely to hit some of these targets. Not just their past performance, not just charts, but actually what's their record on generating cash from their business, from their capital investments? What's their record on paying dividends so big funds keep buying them because they want those dividend deals to pay the pensioners who are the shareholders in those Funds, what's their record on revenue growth, i.e. sales growth, increasing sales and market share and all those things? That might, not for certain, because there's no certainty in the stock market, those factors, just like when you're interviewing somebody for a job, well, have they got a track record of good performance? Those those various things, which universities did they go to, what's their academic credentials? We know sometimes those things are bloody useless. We all hired people who've got top flight CVs and they've turned out rubbish. And people who dropped out of school at 16, who we thought were no hopes, have turned out the most brilliant employees. So it's the same with stocks. So therefore, how can we at least somehow mitigate some of that risk? That's what this webinar is about. We can start off saying, well, actually suggest that I'd be all right with this one for the next 12 months. And I am an owner. But... What are the other factors? My due diligence, due diligence on its on its revenue growth, value. Is the share price currently compared to the profits it's making too expensive to the profits it's making? So I'll explain all of this in the webinar. And that, in a way, okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Peter. Uh, that, in a way, is the essence of this webinar. And I want to try and do it in an interesting manner because my wife said, I'll push you boring. She was talking about my investments and not anything else. Uh, and I want to explain how we can keep it simple after we finish the webinar so that you can find stocks in about 15 minutes, hold them for 12 months, and then leave it and go and play with your kids or grandkids or whatever else afterwards, okay? And let's look at the same with Apple, right? Again, based on its historic performance, were history to repeat itself, and I'm not saying it will, this is what the median performance would be. It would give me a 24% return in the next 12 months. You might say, oh, but are you nuts? 
It's not going to do that. It's probably going to be closer to this. Fine. Then it's going to be this and you don't want to buy it. Simple as that. Or you might say, no, you know what? I think for various reasons, and we'll look at those reasons to do our due diligence. Is it going to be up here? And that's really going to be our decision. Is it going to be median 75th or 25th? In other words, it's going to be as good as the 75 times it's been really in the top 25% of its historic performance, or is it going to be in the bottom 25% of its historic performance or somewhere in between? Okay. And is somewhere in between good enough for our targets? Well, with something like an Apple, I happen to leverage it two times, which I'll talk about later as well, which means if it does do as average as it's tended to do, and you might think that's over optimistic, then instead of 24%, I'll get 50%. Fine. Okay. And you might say, well, no, you're smoking dope, Alpesh. It's going to be probably do 10th worse because it's too expensive. Well, let's look at those factors, in which case we won't buy it. And those factors will be, and, and you want to write this down, valuation, V, growth, G, income or dividend yields, I, momentum, performance, which is one of the factors here, M, okay, cash flow, C, okay, uh, average returns, which is also captured in here, volatility, because we don't want it to be deviating, giving us average 10% per annum, but in actual fact, one year it was up 100%, the rest of the time it was down 25% every year, well, that's not good, that's called volatility, so we want high average returns, but low volatility, that's, that's, that's that's brilliant. And then we want what's called high alpha, outperformance of market. Alpha is just a jargon way of saying, does it outperform the broader market? The broader market represented by, say, the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average you've heard of, which is just a basket of stocks, okay? I'm, I'm teaching some of you to suck eggs. Some of you, this is like a revelation, right? So, so we're going to look at VGIMC, all right? V valuation growth. Why, why are we looking at those factors? Because we know undervalued companies do better than overvalued ones. Research proves it, academic research. We know high growth companies tend to do better than low growth companies. Overall, over the longer term, all other things being equal, we know dividend yielding ones tend to do better. There are exceptions to all of these rules, but as a general rule. So if we do our due diligence and we find companies with a median up here, then with all that other information, we should just simply be able to decide, well, I think it's going to be closer to this than closer to down there. Therefore, yeah, I think I'll, I'll get in. That should simplify our process, shouldn't it? That should really simplify our process. Okay. And, and make life easier. So certainly there's no guarantees in the market, but at least it will remove some of the biggest errors. So let's look at some others that I also happen to own. Right. And you and I may well disagree when I make the case to you as a former barrister, when I make the case to you that actually this will be close to the median or up here based on valuation, growth, income, momentum, cash flow, Sortino, you might turn around and say, no, Alpesh, I've heard all the evidence. I'm a member of the jury and I disagree. Fine. Don't buy it then. There's plenty more fish in the sea. Don't be forced into buying something just because somebody else said so. Make your own mind up, but I'll tell you how you make your own mind up. OK, I tell you how, because too often people say to you, oh, do your own research. Well, what the hell does that mean? How does anybody know what the hell that means? OK, so this is one way I'm going to make life a bit easier. If you, and again, PayPal, I own. Right. It's projected to have a 34 uh, percent uh, return if it hits the median. I think it's going to be from median to good, actually, over the next 12 months. You might say, Alpesh, you're an over optimistic buffoon. It's going to be closer to this. And we can argue the toss based on its valuation, growth, income. Sortina, but at least we'll be arguing on the facts, right? Not upon speculation that somebody said this and, oh, Alpish, I'm going to gamble on the news that I think a lot more people are going online. Therefore, I think it works. Well, that's an untested hypothesis. There may well be. You may well be right. Where's your evidence? Where's your proof? Right? It's a bit like COVID. Give me the evidence. Give me the science. We want to be science and data led. And again, we know that might not get us the right results. There's no guarantees, which I think you'll all accept. There's no guarantees to anything in life, but at least we can do the due diligence. And we have foundations, strong foundations, because this is our pensions we're talking about. Here's another one I own. I'm oh, sorry. No, I don't own. I don't own. I don't own Tesla because it was too volatile for me. Now, some of you, a lot of you ask me, is it too late to get in? Oh, you know, well, if you've got a time machine, no. And you might say, with Tesla, what might it do? Well, do you really think it's going to go to the 90th uh, uh, percentile? In other words, the 10% of best historic performances it's ever had? Well, if you do, you're going to make a killing. You might say, no, Alpesh, it's overbought. It's going to go down round here. Now, personally, I don't have it. OK, the median story is up here, which still suggests a 20% return over the next year. 
I don't have it. If somebody put a gun to my head, because with really volatile stocks, I, my system just won't allow me to buy them. Because if I bought this, I'd have to buy a hundred other volatile stocks and everything that I made from Tesla would have lost on all the other ones. Okay. That's why if there isn't a systematic approach and you might say, well, you're an idiot because you, everybody knows that man's going to go to the moon and have, uh, everlasting batteries. Could you not see the future? And I'll say, no, I couldn't. Congratulations to you. Tell me 10 other companies you also invested in where you lost your money on that same thesis. Do you see what I'm saying? This would not have compensated me. Any strategy which put in Tesla would not have compensated me for all the others, other than if I got lucky and this was the only thing I bought. Okay, it's like going into a casino, putting it on red, winning, and walking out. You're lucky, you're great, well done. But that is not a strategy I can keep using. It's not replicable, okay? Okay, so it doesn't hit my targets. And there's a whole bunch of other reasons, anecdotal stories, like Vlad has said, it's worth more than all the other car companies in the world. Well, some will then rebound and say, it's not a car company. It's a mission to Mars. It's a second Earth company. It's a rocket company. It is a future technology for everything on the planet company, in which case they'll say, it's going to get up here, right? In the 90th percentile. And I'd say, you know what? Good luck to the man. He's done an amazing job. I don't know. And because I don't know, and I don't have a strong enough conviction, thank you very much, I'll go date and marry another company instead. Okay, too volatile, too difficult to see into the future. I'm not saying it's not going to rock it. All I'm saying is, I don't know. So if you are in it, and you put a gun to my head and said, well, what's the strategy, Alpesh? All I would say is this. If it drops 25% from where you've bought it, you might want to have a stop loss and get out. If it doesn't, keep going and just have a trailing 25% stop loss. That's as good as I can come up with. You might think that's a rubbish strategy. Hey, I didn't want to buy into it in the first place. You forced me to. Lamb Research I own, okay? Semiconductors, they make semiconductors, okay? They do all the research to make semiconductors better. Now, I don't look at the story first. I want you to know this. What we're going to teach you in this webinar is we do not look at the story first. I don't start off saying, oh, that company does cloud software for vaccine distributors, which is one I'm going to show you in a second. OK, uh, I don't go around saying, oh, uh, that company makes semiconductors. Everyone's moving to technology and online because of COVID. Its share price is going to rally. I look at the figures first, valuation, growth, income, momentum and so on. I'm going to explain to you why that process is important. I'm going to, I've thrown you some fish now. Okay. I've shown you what's in my, on my plate. I'm going to show you how I cooked it, right? In other words, how I, uh, I'm going to teach you how to fish next. Okay. So lamb research, I like not because of this median return, which is 24% below the 40% I need, but in actual fact, I think it's going to be here. I actually think it's going to be there. I think it's outperformed past performance. Past performance is an in, not an indicator of, uh, of, so future performance is not an indicator of past performance. You know what I mean? It's going to be up here, I think, closer. Now, why do I think that? Well, because I had a look at the valuations, the earnings, the revenue growth, the dividend yields. Okay, Sortino, which is the average returns and its volatility. Jargon, apologies. Alpha, outperformance of market, right? So does it perform better than the market in terms of returns? Does its share price move more than the Dow or the S&P? Okay, just outperforms the market, because if it doesn't, I might as well just put it in an index tracker. So those are the various things. There's a lot of things I've thrown at you. There's a lot of things I've thrown at you. Okay, so let's put it all together in a more systematic approach. I've given you an overview. How do we systemize some of this stuff? Because we know there's returns to be had. But how do we know there's returns to be had? Well, that's the markets over the past, I think it was three months. Uh, 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 so we know, even with some of the bigger names, there's returns we have. We also know there's a, I mean, look at that, bloody hell. I wish, I wish I got into it. Of course I do. I'm not an idiot, but I'm afraid my approach doesn't allow me to. Just like, just like my approach doesn't allow me to go to a casino, uh, other than for fun, but not as an investment strategy, because I can't, I don't have any knowledge to replicate it. I know some people can make money. It's not me. Okay. Um, Disney, as you all know, and we'll come to some of these others. Now, some of you, some of you like the reassurance of name recognition. So the approach I'm going to teach you, looking at valuation, growth, income, momentum, average returns, volatility. I mean, the whole bloody kitchen sink, because we are doing due diligence on the interviewees to be in our portfolio to look after our inheritance and our children's inheritance. So we better be doing proper due diligence, okay? Some of you like the additional assurance of name recognition, and that's fine. You'll say to me, Alpesh, I want companies I've heard of, so I want the same approach you've given, but I want, does it fit into a Costco? Does it fit for a Facebook? Does it fit for a Merck, if you've heard of it? Johnson & Johnson, Eli Lilly, companies you've heard of. And that's perfectly fine. Nike, okay? That's perfectly fine. 
right? I don't want you to feel like, oh, no, I must only get companies I've never heard of. Actually, our due diligence will throw up names you have heard of. Just because you've heard of them doesn't mean they're rubbish, okay? Uh, when you're hiring people for jobs, just because you've heard of Oxford University or Harvard doesn't mean you don't hire them from it and you want them from some university you've never heard of. Same principle, okay? So that's the first thing. This is my son's portfolio. Actually, it's a mixture of my son's and mine um, over the last few months, okay? One of the things I do, and I'm throwing things in a random order. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Uh, I'm throwing the um, things in a slightly random order at you. One of the things I do is I do happen to own the S&P 500 three times daily leverage. And I've had it for a number of years. And I'll tell you why. It's my bet on America. And it's three times leverage. Why is it three times leverage? And that's high risk. I am not recommending you do this. This is not financial advice to you because I do not know your personal circumstances. You might be a 90-year-old grandmother widow with only £10 in the bank. My God, how could I tell you to go leverage? I, I'm just giving you education on how... I do things. Why have I got three times leverage? Well, every time the S&P 500, which I don't think America is going to go bankrupt. <laughs> yeah. We'll argue about that later. I don't think it's going to go bankrupt, right? If it goes up $1, the S&P 500, 500 American companies, I make $3. And this is in a SIP. It can be in a UK SIP or I, so that doesn't matter. It's not the only thing I own because I'm not a gambler. Okay, I've got some of these other ones. Uh, all right, and they've done fine over the last few months. They've done fine over the last few months. So I'm naming names. Sometimes people go, oh, name names to me, name names to me. Right? And some haven't done as well as I thought Thermo Fisher, scientific instruments company. I really thought it'd do better. I'm still going to hold on to it because guess what? Next month, it might shoot up. They tend to go like this instead. They don't tend to go in a diagonal line. I wish they all went up in a straight diagonal line. Of course I do. That company doesn't exist. Sadly, it doesn't exist. They tend to go up in fits and starts. Just the way life is. I wish it wasn't, but it is. Okay, so how do we drill down? Now, by the way, would I buy these today? Oh, that's a different story. So let's look at how we decide what I'd buy today. Valuation, growth, income, momentum. Now, my job, and I like doing it, if you saw, if you're on my free Telegram channel, or if you're a student of mine and you're on my private Telegram channel, you'll know that I was messaging you at about, what, 1 a.m. last night? That's what I do. I love this shit. I love all of this. I'll be up all night for it. I can't actually sleep because I just, look at that. That, that to me is is market pornography. I can't get enough of the markets, okay? I am addicted. It is market alcohol, all right? I have, I need to go to Markets Anonymous. I love the data and the analysis, all right? Uh, and, and so I'm going to show you how we drill all that down to get from 9,000 stocks to what I think should be in people's portfolio is 15. I'm not saying there's only a specific 15. I'm saying there's about 200 approved you should pick from 15 and any 15 out of that 200 will be much of a muchness okay but it is it's not 9000 stocks it's about 200 which when you filter down valuation growth income momentum alpha sortino right remember alpha is our performance of market sortino is average returns being high and volatility being low that's what that jargon means that's all not very complicated okay then there's about 200 companies which are really good just like in any job application there's only a very few percentage of people who are actually worth looking at their applications taking to the final round of interviews it's the same job and then out of that you can pick out of those 200 you can actually pick it out of a hat they're much of a muchness you're not trying to pick the 15 biggest movers for next year nobody can do that that would be witchcraft you're trying to pick 15 which will give you a 40 percent return that's all and the other place i then reinforce my views just so to make sure i'm not the only genius in the room is to make sure well actually if some of these people with big sums of money like jp morgan also mentioning some of the companies that i've drilled down to so i do it in that order my due diligence first and then are they mentioning it not are they mentioning it, therefore i'll buy it that doesn't make sense they could be wrong they could be doing all sorts of stuff the other thing i want to go through and i've said this before reports like this so goldman sachs look at that date i want you to look at what the market did on march the 26th basically the market stopped falling on march the 26th and started rising this is when they released this and if you've been following me on telegram and uh, my emails and everything else and my webinars you'll know i've been saying i've shown this before now i didn't know the market was going to turn around then i mean i know goldman's gave this report but that so what i don't just buy everything they say okay so part of what I'm going to do is incorporate not just all of those things, hard numbers. I'm not just going to be spreadsheet Alpesh, but I think it's important also to give um, right at the end, well, is there a story as well that fits? So stories are less important to me, you know. So is there a story like, oh, I just also, on top of everything else, I've got a report from Goldman saying, bye, bye, bye. Hmm. Okay then that adds to it, okay? So it's it's the X factor, you might call it. The little sprinkle of 
you know, just a little bit of extra. And that's where the experience and expertise comes in. It's that 10%, which makes a 90% difference as well, right? So let's get on with it. Now, people worldwide want to know what I'm about to uh, By the way, I'm not saying want to, <laughs> to want to know it only from me. They just want to know it generally. How do I know this? Well, because when I, when I look at the investment books and all the rest of it, and I've written this one and it's coming out later and uh, you can't even buy it yet, okay? Everyone in the world wants to know about investing. So God bless you for being on this webinar, right? My job, Tech Target I own, my job is 12-month holdings, 15 stocks. If they drop 25% from the high point since I bought them, I get out. Listen to that again. A very simple rule. Why do I keep it simple? I've got better things to do. I, I, yeah, what I mean, I, I actually don't like just looking at the bloody portfolio all day and all night, okay? I do like to play with my son. I like to spend time with my wife my family, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so if it drops 25% from the highest it's been since I bought it, I get out. You can have more complicated rules if you want. You can tie yourself in knots all you want. Up to you. But that simple rule will get, as as, as they say in America, will get shit done. All right? 40% is the target that I'm looking for. Don't achieve it every year. I mean, bloody hell, 2008? Do you think I got 40% return? Of course not. I had a negative return. The whole market crashed. What do you think I am? Um... Satan, that I can do the opposite of what's possible. My job is to turn 10Ks into millions over a number of years, not every year. <laughs> okay, so we'll look at some of the maths on that and how long would that take? Okay, how long would that take, right? Ignore that for a second. I mean, it's just a sort of a more, it's just to put a mission statement, you know, because mission statements give you focus. Okay, and the kinds of stocks, if they've got good valuation, growth, income, momentum, cash flow, they should be like this. They should be what's called square root stocks. I, I didn't invent that term, but I like the term. And all it means is this. When the markets are rising, they should rise like that. And I don't, I can't predict if the market is going to rise or fall. Nobody can. But what we can predict is when they rise, we want the kind of companies which go up. And when they fall, they don't fall as far. When the markets fall, of course they fall. Everything bloody falls when the markets fall. Don't tell me I'm going to predict when the market is going to fall up. I'm going to then put it all into Bitcoin at that time. Okay, and then I'm going to get out of Bitcoin when the market starts rising again, and I'm going to put it in. Well, if, that, if you want to gamble, and well, if you've got a crystal ball like that, well done. Why the hell are you on my webinar? You're a genius, obviously. Okay, but for the rest of us, we want the kind of companies based on the due diligence that I'm going to do, which when the markets rise, they go up. Well, everybody can do that. But the hard part's this bit. They should be the resilient companies, the square root companies which don't fall as far when the markets fall, so we get to keep more of our money and then resume backwards. How do we ensure companies like that? What are square root companies? They are companies with not just low valuations. You see, when you speak to fund managers and journalists, they will pick only one thing. They'll either pick valuation or growth or income or some story. They won't look at all the due diligence. In other words, they're not doing full and total due diligence. Now, sometimes it's negligence, sometimes it's incompetence, same thing. And sometimes it's because they're ignorant. They just don't know. They've never, nobody's ever taught them. They've never met me, you know? They've not read one of my books. By the way, have all of you got a copy of this? Um, a free copy, a digital copy, I should say. Have you all got a digital copy of this, free? You should all have a free digital copy of this. If you haven't, put it in the chat box, okay? You should all have it. You should all have it, okay? So it's value, growth, income, momentum, cash flow, Sortino Alpha. Those are the various factors we're going to look at. And now we'll look at a bit of a story as well. Harpish, how the hell do we do that quickly without spending all night on it like you do? Uh, and we don't just want to rely on when you throw some fish, when you deign your royal highness to throw some fish on a webinar, should you find enough time, okay? No, 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 we want to do it ourselves. We want to be self-sufficient. We want to be independent of you, Alpish. I quite agree, okay? So that's what this is. Um, like I said earlier on, uh, this is information and education. It is not advice on go and buy these because these are suited to my personal circumstances. They may well not be suited to yours. And just a reminder again, 12 months. Why are we looking at 12-month holdings? Goldman Sachs said, if you're going to buy and hold, um, John and everybody else who puts it in, um, who haven't got it, I'll tell you at the webinar, at the end of the webinar, how to get it, how to download it. Oh, well, I'll tell you now, alpishpatel.com. Just go to alpishpatel.com. Look at the picture of the Duchess of um, Cambridge. Uh, and under that, there's a button which says free book. Click that. Okay. As John Lennon once said to me, Alpesh, stop name dropping. Some of you will get that joke. Uh, alpishpatel.com. It's on there. Okay. There's a button you click. Uh, now, 12 months is what we're going to look at. By the way, one, one other thing I've always said in all my webinars, I'm not just trying to uh, make you money. 
Okay, I do have a mission to teach a million people through my books, through my webinars, through my TV programs, through my free course material. I do have a mission to teach a million people how to invest. However, starting with my family, and big as they are, they're not a million people. <laughs> Some of you might think, are you kidding? You're Indian. Uh, the, one of the more useful things I want to do with that capital is, and I am co-chairman of the Lumbar Trust, which looks after widows and orphans. My other chairman is Lord Bill Amoria, founder of Cobra Beer, president of the CBI. It was founded by Lord Lumbar. Uh, and we look after widows and orphans around what well, you don't have to donate to us. But when you make money, if you've got more than enough to look after your family, please think about giving to something bigger than me. Forgive me for preaching. I'm sure more of I'm sure all of you are more generous than I am. But forgive me for preaching. But when I've done this in the past, it's actually resulted in people donating. And they've said to me, we've just done this. We've done that. And, and it's phenomenal. It makes me feel better anyway for giving the webinars. OK, so listen, my wife said, Arpej, you're not going to teach about valuation growth. This is too complicated. This is boring. Just, just cut to the chase of it. You know, these are all factors which can move a company. Are we really going to look at all of these? Are we are you really going to sit there and bore them with all of this? Isn't it better to tell them, listen, these are all factors that can move a company's price. They vary at different times. Why don't we just pick the ones with the best valuations and the best growth? You see, on TV, you will constantly hear people saying, oh, it's a value stock, we're moving from value to growth, or we're in a momentum phase. Well, that's fine for chit-chatting on TV, okay? That's fine for chit-chatting on TV. I'm sure many of you see me chit-chatting on the BBC about stocks and all the rest of it, and this is the approach I use when I'm on there. Okay, the fact of the matter is, that's all well and good, but when I'm picking my portfolio, I want to know something very simple. By the way, subscribe to my YouTube channel because you're going to get some amazing uh, uh, content that you might have missed uh, like today and whatever else. Um, uh, so what I want them to, pause that. What I want to do is say to you, okay, look, I've done all that. I've looked at the valuation and the growth and the income and the momentum and the statistics because I'm doing due diligence for my son's future. You better believe I've done the bloody due diligence on every single one of these factors. Don't trust the journalist. A journalist gets paid by the word. When I was writing my weekly investment column in the Financial Times, I got paid a pound a word. OK, a pound a word. Guess what? I had a weekly deadline. Yeah. For a stock, your typical journalist, not me, typical journalist is going to pick one factor, earnings, or they might even pick two, sales. They're going to write 500 words. They're going to get their 500 quid. Editor's happy. They're happy. A bit of clickbait uh, uh, headline. And that's it. Do you really think that journalist is going to look at every single one of these? Do you think that journalist has got a child whose future inheritance is dependent upon it? No. See, so stop reading bloody journalists, will you, for God's sake, right? They're going to blow up. They've got a conflict of interest with you. And fund managers, their job is to do a UK value fund, a Japan growth fund. It is not to do, we have one fund. It is the value growth income momentum statistics fund. That's it. They don't do that. Nobody does that. Why? Because if they can keep dipping into your pocket, then they would do it. So please, fund managers, conflict of interest with you. The secret is really simply this. You can take a picture of all of this. I'm going too quick. Companies which fall the least in down markets rebound the most in rising markets. I've named some of the names already. I'm going to name some more. I'm going to show you the process. Everyone is a genius in rising markets. It's not how much you make. It's how much you keep. Companies which fit the above a few, approximately 10% of 9,000. There's 9,000 companies listed in the United Kingdom and the United States and global companies listed in the United States. I'm not going to look at companies listed in Vietnam or China, unless they've got a stock market listing in America or the United Kingdom. Why? It's just easier. All right. It's just easier. You've got to stop somewhere. I might as well look at bloody Martian companies. All right. 9,000 is enough to pick from. And on top of that, you've got another 5,000 funds, exchange traded funds, which are basically trackers. You've got all of this. This is 5,000. So I'm going to teach you what to look for. If you say to me, I oh, forget all of that. I'm really interested in China. Uh, or I'm really interested in, I don't know, you might be interested in momentum, or I'm really interested in Russell 1000 or clean energy, uh, innovative technology, or whatever. Well, how do I decide what to get into? Or Europe utilities, Europe technology, okay? How do I decide? Great sexy names, all of these. How have you filtered 5,000 down into, I mean, look at that, 5,000 down into just 200. And what did you do? Well, with any interview process, you've got to have a filtering process. So we're going to do that in one second, one second, one second. I'll show you how, and I'll give you the fish as well. Okay, so the companies, like I said, sorry to labor the point, it's these things. Okay, I've already said it a million times, so I'm going to bore you with it one more time. And in one sense, you might say, well, how do we know anybody else is doing this? Okay, if they're not doing it, then whoops, 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 whoops. Sorry, got a bit stuck then right? How do we know anybody else? Well, actually, they are. 
They are. Goldman Sachs call it sustained. They all have different names, but they're essentially doing the same thing. This is their wealth management division, uh, whose clients are seriously rich. Okay. Uh, JP Morgan have a similar thing. Deutsche Bank have a similar thing. They just give it different names. They're looking at management quality, industry positioning, return on capital. Now they, um, look at this factor, which I really like as well. Okay. So my job was to be a spy as a hedge fund manager. I get access to this stuff. Be a spy take out what they're doing, and then add it to my own approach. Yeah, I spied on them, okay? And I stole what they've got because I think knowledge should be uh, universal and democratic. I don't think it should be behind firewalls just for the rich. I don't think the rich should be the only ones getting the best knowledge. I grew up in a small town, born and raised in a small town called Armley. It's one of the poorest parts of Leeds. You better believe I think education should be universal and not only for the rich, okay? So... My approach is just actually a different variation of what these guys do, which gives me some reassurance. It should give you some reassurance, right? In essence, like I said, what I'm doing is I don't just look at value stocks or just income stocks or growth stocks, which is what the journalists do and what the fund managers trying to get you to do. I look at this. Nobody does this. The only people who do this are Goldman Sachs Wealth Management or JP Morgan Wealth Management or where they're doing it one-to-one one-to-one all right the big mass market retail fund managers the apps that you see advertised on tv saying hey you got five pence left over from your coffee why don't you put it into a fund all they're doing is they're putting it into low medium or high risk in a basket not into the the few that it should be in i get all those stocks we do the analysis and pick a portfolio of 14 to 15 14 to 15 <laughs> leads indeed bill uh okay and that gives me enough risk management because if you divide all your capital into 15ths, you might only have 15,000 pounds. You might have 500 pounds. Okay, well, you're only going to be able to buy one share of one stock probably. That's fine. At least you started. At least you got the process and the education type. You might have 15,000 pounds. You divide it into 15 equal lots of 1,000 pounds each. Why not? Simple as anything else. Okay. And you, if anything should drop 25% from the highest it's been, let's say as soon as you bought it, it dropped 25%. Well, you'll have lost 1.8% of your total capital. One fifteenth, a quarter of one fifteenth is 1.8%. That's not bad risk management. If I went too quick, I can return to it later. I don't want to bore you with this. My wife says, stop boring people. That's my spreadsheet. Value, momentum, ownership, quality, all of these factors. Okay, out of these companies, I don't own Kroger, but I didn't have a problem with it. Um, I do have all green boots. Uh, I have Dollar Tree. Do, 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 yeah, it's difficult for you to see on screen. Apologies. But anyway, that's the filtering. So let's get on with teaching you some of that. And I've, by the way, all of this I've been talking about in the Financial Times before it's been printed in my columns and all the rest of it. Uh, and it's based on research. What has worked in investing studies of investment approaches and characteristics associated with exceptional returns, right? Uh, if you want to stay to the end, I'll tell you, I'd get a free download of that as well. Uh, 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 as well. So you, th this is the bit where my wife says, no, you're boring people. They don't give a shit about all this academic research. And, you know, it's the top quartile of book value, i.e. valuation. And those companies tend to outperform the market and they get a three-year average return of 87%. They don't care. People don't care about eight, seven percent in three years. They just want you to give the answers, not that you've done all the academic research. So I'm not going to bore you with this this time. OK, I'm not going to bore you with the Journal of Portfolio Management and the sources of data which shows what we should be looking at in terms of yields and why I look at income. And I've been using this approach. It's been independently verified since 2004, which is when they started verifying me. Uh, it's a Financial Times award winning uh, software company, which has been verifying all of it. I'm not going to name them because you don't need the name. Uh, and yeah, we've been doing all right from 2004 till 2019, uh, 10,000 has become half a million. Okay. Uh, that's on UK only. UK only is only 20% per annum, unfortunately. Um, and I'm, like I said, I'm not going to go through a single one of these criteria. Now, first things first, I've said for a long time, I don't just buy UK stocks. If you think I'm lying, I'm not. That's my column in 1999 in the Financial Times, my very first column in the Financial Times. Yes, what's more, they should probably sell up their entire UK holdings and buy only US stocks. My point being global. So I'm going to teach you global. If you only look at UK, you're going to be in a poverty trap. And I've not just been a has-been, uh, <laughs> grey hair, did it once, still been doing the same stuff. So there's consistency and a track record. What is it we're after? This, this, that is just one year alone. The gap between having a broader market that we choose from, which includes, say, the NASDAQ, giving us a 50% return, pretty much, and the UK market alone, which gives us minus 10%. Right. That's a 50 percent difference in just one year, in just one year. This is why British people tend to be poor in their pensions because they tend to invest in domestic stocks. 
and don't realize they can still put uh, international equities into it, okay? And why those in other countries, like the US, tend to get richer. Not because they're cleverer. <laughs> you can argue the toss if you think Americans are cleverer than British people, <laughs> okay? Uh, well, I've got some evidence which is on my side that they're not, right? It's because they invest in their domestic market and it's gone up more. So how are we gonna find those stocks, okay? Just because they do that doesn't mean we do it. Assume you plan to invest over 10 years in ba baskets of 12 months, okay? And with my help, let's say you only make 20%, not 40, and every year it won't be 20, some years it'll be more, some years it'll be less. But from what I'm teaching you, we're filtered, 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 and we get to a modest 20%. Nothing extravagant, nothing pessimistic. Some years it'll be less, some years it'll be more, right? Let's say you've got 10K, so all you've got is 10K, right? Uh, in, and look, you might only have 1,000. At least you can start the education and the learning process for when you have more, all right? 401k, SIP, or ISA. So it can be in your pension or savings or investment account, doesn't matter, can be tax-free. Let's assume tax-free for the moment, right? You also plan to add 500 each month to that portfolio. It might be 500 a month or it might be in one go, 6,000 every year, which is a lot, I know, for most people, but, I'm, you know, I'm, it is what it is. You'll have more than 600k in 15 years. That's the math. This is what happens. You start off with 10K, you make those modest contributions, and you end up with that, 600K. You end up with 600K after 15 years. That's my son's ISA. My son's ISA, he was born about two years ago, okay? He was born two years ago. That's what happens. That's what happens. That's what happens with him. Uh, okay, this is his ISA, and... That's the, that's the direction in which it goes. That's the direction in which it goes. It keeps going upwards. That's the plan. So by the time he goes to university, uh, I don't want to have to worry about him. I didn't carry the heavy weight. The stocks that I bought and the companies that I invested in, they're the ones who were working for him, not me. I don't want daddy working for my son, right? I'm sure you as parents don't want to be working for your bloody children all the rest of your lives. No, no, no. I didn't do the work. It'll be whoever I invest in, whether it's a Viva Systems, or, and I did that broadcast yesterday. I've not mentioned it. I own Viva, V-E-E-V-A. Have a look at it. The reason I own it is because it met those criteria of valuation, growth, income, momentum, uh, Sortino. It just so happens they do cloud software for uh, distributors of the virus. I didn't start with the story. I happen to be on TikTok, by the way. So I did a little TikTok video about that point. I don't. I didn't buy the story first. I did the numbers first and then the story. And I looked at the story and thought, oh, nice little sprinkling icing on the cake. I love it. I love the story as well. Okay, So it was that way around. Now, let's say instead you're a bit richer and you assume, to, and you, uh, uh, assume you plan to invest over 10 years and with my help make 20% per annum. Okay, let's say you make 20%, same 20%, some, some years more, some years less. Let's say you have 100K. So you've got a bit more money. You might be in your 50s, 60s. Some of you have got 10 million. Okay, some of you got 10 million, all right, uh, 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 in your pockets. And that's fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which, because it's all about where you also aspire to be. Right. You also plan to add one and a half thousand each month or whatever uh, uh, at the end of the year. You'll have a million at the end of 10 years. 10 years, you'll have a million. So how do I convert in 10 years somebody from 100K to a million? Now, my job for my family is not to get 20% per annum. My job, they've charged me with, is to get 40% per annum. That's my business. I can't hit it every year. Some years it's more, some years it's less. I use a bit of leverage. That's my risk profile. That's my business. Nobody else's, okay? So I'm keeping it 20% as modest for others. And you might say, well, who the hell is getting 20%? It's not me getting 20%. Um, it's Tech Target getting 20%. It's... It's it's the companies that I mentioned earlier. It's MasterCard getting me 20%. Not me, it's PayPal, it's Square getting 20%. The tech companies that I mentioned at the start, I'm not doing it. I'm not taking credit for it. Oh, yeah, what makes you think you can do it? I don't. I think those companies can. Thank you very much. Not me, not me. Hey, if I could, I would have founded Facebook. I would have founded Alphabet, all right? If I was that clever, I'm not. I just ride their coattails. I'm not that clever at all. I stand on the shoulders of giants. That's all I do, okay? Simple as that. That's all investors do. We're in a pretty worthless profession, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, so that's where we are. That's where we are on it, okay? Uh, and that's where we want to get to. It's a very simple mission. Now, the reason I don't like active fund managers, right? The reason I don't like fund managers, conflict of interest. I don't like brokers. I don't like brokers because what they do, they're a necessary because I've got to use them to buy stocks. And we'll talk about which brokers uh, you, know, you can use, whether it's Halifax, 
uh, Barclays, AJ Bell, uh, there's so many, okay? Uh, the interactive investors, another one which comes up, perfectly fine. They all have marginal differences between their costs. I'm not bothered about five pounds zero there. Are you kidding me? If you're making the kind of returns we want to be making, what the hell do I care about five pounds here or there? Really don't, okay? But they keep trying to shove you because they're distributors of funds. So they've got a conflict of interest. If they were just brokers, I'd be happy. Oh, a new one's free trade. Have a look at it. Seems all right. Seems all right. I've not done proper due diligence, but it seems all right. Okay. Um, if they just did the transactions, that'd be fine. But they want to flog you funds because they're greedy and they want to make more money and get more kickbacks. Never use them for funds. Okay. They've got a conflict of interest, which they disclose in small print. I hate them for it. Right. And not only that, this is an FT article. And this is me. I've written about it in the Financial Times or Active Fund Managers. They're not that good. They're not that good. Not because of incompetence. Uh, that one's fine, Peter. From what I understand, I've not done a proper. Uh, uh, thank you, kid. I know. Uh, we'll, we'll speak later. I'm going to broadcast out of that room, though, kid. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah, I know. No, no, no. We'll. <laughs> what to do next is often just waiting to make more. It's you don't have to panic, but we'll. We'll. I'll explain that strategy to you in terms of what to do next, uh, kid. Um, oh, when he says GIP, he means the Great Investment Program, which is what we're talking about here. The hidden poverty gap, right? That's why we're looking global. That's the that's the poverty gap between them elsewhere investing in, and that's the NASDAQ, 128% up in five years. Now, I'm not saying go by NASDAQ. I'd be an idiot if I just said that. That'd be too stupid. What I'm saying is there is a poverty gap just by being in the wrong market, okay? And the market's going to be, we're going to look at all of these, not just trying to pick from the UK. Because if we just did that, we'd be, picking, we'd be fishing from an air fish pond. The other problem you have, I want to solve all your problems, name the stocks again and reiterate the process again, is this. Typically, the bad, so one of my students, I said to him, send me your portfolio. I asked all my students, send me your portfolio and we analyze it for them based on my education, my uh, criteria. And so we analyzed it for them and this was his. And I said, why the hell have you got such a sh rubbish portfolio? And it was down between 20 and 40% over the last three months. And he said, well, I went by name recognition. Aviva, BA Systems, Santander, Barrett. Put your hands up if you own any of these. BP, BT, Centrica, Foxtons, Lloyds, National Grid, Shell, okay? I said to him, look, I don't have a problem with you having a special strategy, let's say for HSBC, which is a 20-year low, on the basis that at a 20-year low, it's probably not going to go bust. And as it's historically done from these price levels over the last 20 years, it'll probably just through volatility alone double up at some point in the next one to three years. I said, I don't have a problem with that strategy. But that's a special situation strategy. You don't have too many of those. That applies to BP, applies to HSBC and Lloyds. It's not a great strategy, you know, doubling up thanks to volatility, hopefully. Not the strategy I like because it's not a, it's not based on growth and valuation and all these other factors that I like to tick. It's more on chance, but it will work, right? Because random stock price movements alone will make sure HSBC will probably return that. But I said, on the whole, name recognition is a bad way. That's a typical bad portfolio. So let's get you away from it. The other bad mistake a lot of you are making that I want to avoid you making as well. So this isn't just about, let me give you some stock names. This is also about stop doing the bad things you've been doing, is this. You give your money to fund managers who, this is a typical fund manager one of my students had invested in, uh, UK listed equity growth. Sounded sexy. He said, it got all these diamonds up, and it says growth. And it's got this letter A, and it's got this number 8 out of 10. And it had the word booster. And it comes from Vitality, who were in health. Healthcare. And I said, yeah, obviously, if you're selling health insurance, you should be selling funds as well. Hmm, that makes sense. You know, why don't you get your stock picks from um, your garage mechanic? Makes sense. You know, yeah. So over three years, down 2%. One of the greatest bull markets in history, and this fund is down 3%. He's, he's typical. This fund manager is typical. And these are typically what they own. This is a shot of what that fund owns. If you don't know the underlying top 10 assets of the funds that you've invested in, you've not done due diligence. You are a gambler. You are negligent. It is your fault, not the fund manager's fault. It's your fault that you're paying fast and loose with your money. And when your spouse is angry at you while your kids have not got the bigger pension that they read in the newspaper, everybody else seems to be getting, is because you didn't do that. OK, and this is freely available. I'll do it for free for you. OK, if you don't know where to get that information, email me. I will give that bloody information free. I'll tell you where to get it free. If you don't know which funds, uh, 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 what, the, what your fund owns. OK, what your fund owns. Uh, uh, and that's the problem because they put it into British American tobacco and call it growth. 
Okay, so we're going to avoid that. The other problem you've got is when you give it to a fund manager, you be your own fund manager. Don't give it to a fund manager. This is what happens. This is a screenshot from them. Moderate scenario, right? They said what you might get back after cost. Average return each year, 5%. Are you kidding me? Are you bloody kidding me? 5% per year is what you're going to give you? Oh, wow, well, wow, well, Pesh. Yeah, but we're British. We're, we're, we're used to being ripped off. There's even a TV program called Rip Off Britain. We're, we're, bank account's got nothing. Who's getting more than 5% anywhere anyway? That's not a bank account. If that was a bank account, fair enough. You gave it and took extra risk by putting it in the stock market. That's a fund manager. And he's giving you a bit better than a bank account? Are you kidding me? Okay, and do you know what else he's doing? It's because of that, after costs. Every £10,000 you give them, £1,000 goes into costs over five years. £1,000 goes, 10% is costs over five years, right? We don't want to be that person. We've got to stop being that person to fund managers. Okay, and if you think, oh, you're all brave, you're saying it, you know, on a webinar, I dare you to say it in front of their face, just look at my YouTube channel, and I've said it on Sky News, I have said it on the BBC over and over again. You can be better than overpaid fund managers. And if you think I'm just gobby and a bit full of it and a bit arrogant, 2004, I did it, right? Because the FT said, you're a bit gobby, you're a bit loud. I said, when I beat all the fund managers you put in front of me, I want you to put on the front cover of your business page, Patel is top FTSE forecaster. And they had Neil Woodford in there because they thought he's shit hot. Alpa shall never beat him, right? I did. And in 2017, this guy, Jesus, how much of your money has he lost? There's your 10% cost. Investment, 10,000. This is a screenshot from a typical UK fund. If you cash in after five years, recommended holding period, 1,000 pounds is your total cost. The other problem you always say you've got is when to sell. I'll give you, I'll simplify it for you. You sell at the end of 12 months or reevaluate if it still fits your criteria of valuation, growth, income, momentum. How do we do that? I'll tell you that in a second. Or it drops 25% from the highest point since you bought it. Okay, that's it. That's it. Take a picture of this. Take a picture. If you don't understand it, we'll talk about it more in the Q&A. That's it. So what are the strategies? How do I adopt my strategies? How do we do that value, growth, income, momentum, all the things um, that I just said to you, Okay. I look at valuation, growth, income, momentum, all those things I said, and I look to see, does it fit into as many of my investment strategies as possible? One of those, one of those investment strategies are, is, is, is it being held by big money? Why? Well, because big money can often be self-fulfilling. Is it held by big money? So I'll look at hedge fund ownership reports. And I want to see it in this list, securities added list, not in the securities dropped list. Otherwise, I'll start getting worried. Okay. So I mean I bought it just because of that, right? It just means the ones which show me, like Etsy, which I like, the ones which show me valuation, growth, income, momentum, cash flow, Sortino, better be in the securities added by hedge funds. It's in and of itself, it is not a sufficient condition. It's a necessary condition for those of you who understand logic and phys um, philosophy. T. Rowe Price, I like. Doesn't mean I don't like the others. It's just that I can't own everything, can I? Interesting that they've got Ryanair there. Mm -hmm. Uh, electronic arts I own, I should say. Uh, I forgot about that, actually. Yeah. Um, again, it's got a story. Gaming, people sitting at home. That's not why I bought it. It's because the numbers were there. Okay. I don't have anything in the securities drop list, thankfully. Thankfully. Okay. I don't have Twitter. Never liked it. Don't have Snap. Don't have Wix. Okay. By the way, nice little heads up, all of this. And then you see it falling. Now, uh, I'll also look at seeing, like I said, is it on the list of the big funds which are doing the best returns, right? So John Kim of Hedge Fund Night Owl, 51% per, per annum, more than my targeted 40%. Which one of these I own? Amazon, Microsoft. I own these on double leverage as well as the underlying stocks. I don't have Shopify, but I don't have a problem with it. MasterCard, Visa, I own. Fiverr has been in the news. I didn't pick it up in time. I can't own everything, but it was one that I know I liked. Okay, I will look to see. Is it on the list of the Bill Ackmans, the billionaires? These are billionaires. So you'll have to take a picture of this because it's a bit fuzzy. Let me zoom in. Okay, and I look at their top holdings. Now, just because it's in there doesn't matter. It's still needs to be valuation growth income momentum okay all those other factors okay and then i look to see what do they own just because he owns starbucks doesn't mean i'm going to own it it still needs to meet all my criteria i'm an independent thinker i don't care if a billionaire owns fiserv okay i need to know whether or not it still meets my other criteria but that is one factor that i look into and don't forget they might own some of these because they have other reasons right they might have other reasons so it's the job of my team to tell me, and you'll know General Murders has just made an all-time high. Well, 
you got a bit of a heads up because guess who bought it at the end of not last year, the year before Warren Buffett. And people said, you're freaking crazy, Mr. Buffett. Gerald Motors has just made an all time high, highest it's ever been in its history. Mm. So what we do is get the data on not only what are they buying, but how big an impact is it relative to their overall portfolio. Then we aggregate that data. Okay, and I'm sharing it with you. It's here. If you go, where is it, Alpesh? Somebody wants something. Where is it? Here. It's in front of you, right? Uh, uh, that's United Healthcare. That's Amazon. What this does is it then puts into dark green the ones which as many as possible have got it. That is not sufficient for me to buy it. It's a necessary condition, but not sufficient. Still need valuation, growth, income, momentum, and all those other boring things I already mentioned. I will also have a separate strategy, which I've already told you. I leverage big. I leverage two to one on what I consider lower risk. What are the lower risk ones? Well, I happen to have two times leverage on Amazon. I have two times leverage. Oh, there it is. You can do that as an ETF or a CFD. It's more expen uh, It's more risky. Separate discussion on that. Microsoft, I have as well. Um, uh, so it gives you an idea on the leverage. I'll also have a look at what some of the biggest funds, like the quality fund, it's an exchange traded fund, which has so-called quality companies in it, which whilst it falls, rises. So falls less, rises more. What's in it? Now, just because these are the top 10 holdings, take pictures. I'm going to go through this quick. I'm not going to slow down for people who are slow. Please take pictures. Just because it has those doesn't mean I'm going to buy all of these. I, I do happen to have Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, MasterCard, Visa, Nike. Uh, I think I had, I can't remember if they got Merck. Honestly, can't remember. Okay. Um, I'm going to look at which ones contribute the best returns to that. Okay. Which ones contribute the best return? Remember, this is only for 12 months. You might say, oh, great. Thanks, Arpesh. Don't need to ever speak to you again for the rest of your life. No, this is a 12 month holding period. I also look to see what the banks are telling their big clients. Not because that's enough. It's, it's not a sufficient condition. It's necessary. So Citigroup, did it meet my other criteria? In April, Okay, if you're on my webinars in April, I said it'll go from 42, which is where it was, to closer to its price analyst price target. Well, it's reached 60, which means a 50% return. Okay, similarly with Capri Holdings. What were the bank analysts? And by analysts, I do not mean Hargreaves Lansdowne analysts. I do not mean stockbrokers. I do not mean Shares Magazine or the Sunday Times bloody tipster. Okay, for God's sake, I'm talking about Goldman Sachs analysts or JP Morgan. And I want to know not just what the analyst has said, what's his track record? When did he say it? And how high a target did he state? All of those factors, because if you think about it logically, they're all bloody important. Not just uh, somebody said this target, right? Capri Holdings, I said in April can go from 12 to 30. Today, it's at 42. That's a 250% return. That'll make up for some of my more anemic returns, um, which like Thermo Fisher, which is only up, I don't know, 20%. OK, so I'll make up for it. That's the whole idea. Not every stock will go up the same, even though the criteria of selection is the same. Just like in a job interview, you use the same criteria to pick everyone, but some people do better than others. Why? Well, that's just randomness of markets that some do better than others. OK, within the constraint of quality. Right? I'm not going to go through all of these, but we did the same with Disney. I did this for my sister. You'll remember. Those of you who've been on my webinars will know this. In March, I said 99 to 144. She needed safe stocks for my nephew's school fees, you know, so it couldn't be too volatile. Um, and so I had to pick something with less volatility, but still met all the other criteria. Why did I say it? Well, because I said there was a 44% upside. Actually, it turned out to be 73%. Um, I'm her favorite brother. In March, I said this one, Uber, you might have heard of it, could go um, from 27 to 43 and it's 85% return indeed. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Viacom, you've heard of 190% return. That's not the point. United Healthcare, which I own, right? That's only given me a 41% return. Okay, bit anemic, I wish it could, but it was a big company. It was one of my safer picks. It's not just an analyst. It has to be at a big house. It has to be somebody who's got a good track record and they've said it recently and they've got a high price target. It's got to be all those factors. One, two, Three, four, five, five bloody factors just there alone, okay? Okay, where'd you get it from? I'm just giving it to you. I'm just giving it to you, okay? I also, as you many of you will know, look at this. This is probably the most, well, one of the most important things I look for. This is cash flow. Goldman Sachs look at it as well. I stole it from them. I stole it from them. I had a I had a lunch with um, Jim O'Neill, who was then chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management at their offices at Goldman. He's now chairman of Chatham House where I'm on the council, I was on the council rather for six years, uh, and I stole it from that launch and I've been using it ever since. Okay, cash return on capital invested. It's just cash flow of a company. That's all it is, cash flow of a company. That's all it is, the cash flow. Well, it's slightly sophisticated, 
measure of it. Uh, Deutsche Bank invented it. Goldman Sachs used it for their richest clients. And what they discovered is that those companies in the top 20% 